Ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and get started, please. Thank you. Welcome to the ISU faculty and staff presidential uh, candidate open forum. My name is Gene Warren, and I am the faculty senate co-chair and a member of the ISU uh, president search committee. Uh, the committee chair asked that I facilitate this forum. If you have any, uh, uh, if you have a comment about our candidates, please go to the presidential search website. I uh, we'll also need to announce that Friday at midnight, so this Friday at midnight would be the last time that they will be accepting comments about any of the candidates. Uh, so please uh, make some comments if you need to. The, that information will go directly to the State Board of Education. We appreciate the time our candidate has uh, taken to visit us today. We only have 45, uh, 45 minutes with them, so we need to really set a few ground rules uh, so that everybody will have a chance to ask a question. Please limit your question to one minute or less and ask only one question, please. We ask that our candidate be brief and stay on topic when they're answering the question. Um, if there is time near the end of the forum, I will invite additional questions, uh, but we need to end on time because our candidate has an appointment at, right at five o'clock. Uh, there's a couple of mics down here in the aisle. They should be ready to go. Uh, I'll do a quick uh, bio on our candidate, so uh, we'll go from there. So, uh, Dr. Robert Marley currently serves as the Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor at the Missouri University of Science and Technology and is a professor in the Engineering, Management, and Systems Engineering Department. Marley began his professional career as a Rehabilitation Engineering Analyst at the Cerebral... You got it. Cerebral, I don't know why the name is just out of there, sorry. Uh, Palsy uh, Research Foundation, where he helped design adaptive technologies for severely disabled adults. He pursued research questions uh, in ergonomics and human factors, engineering challenges related to cumulative trauma disorders. Marley joined Montana State University in 1990 in the Mechanical and Industrial Engineering Department and went on to hold positions as Associate Dean and then the Dean of the College of Engineering at MSU and later as Interim Vice President of the stu of Student Service or Student Success. <clears throat> In 2012, uh, Marley was selected to join the prestigious ACE Fellows Program for Leadership Development serving at Texas A&M University. In his leadership roles, Marley has led numerous initiatives to increase student and faculty success. Results uh, include enrollment growth, increases in research, new programs and facilities, as well as prominent national and international awards for students and faculty. He has also helped secure approximately $114 million in new private, state, and federal support for various programs and facilities. Marley holds a, a bachelor's, a BS degree in uh, general studies as well as an MS and PhD in industrial engineering from Wichita State University. He and his wife Margaret, hold, uh, who holds a BS in microbiology, resides in Rolla, Missouri, where they enjoy many outdoor, outdoor activities. So please welcome Dr. Robert Marley. Thank you, thank you very much. And I'm assuming, uh, hold okay? Great. Well, thank you so much. This has been a meeting and it's, uh, my, my voice I think is gonna hang with me, but uh, bear with me a little bit. I have some water I may need to sip on. Been, uh, seem like I'm talking nonstop today, which is fun. And I've been looking forward to this meeting with you today. Um, so I was told earlier 10 minutes, and because I know time is short, um, Gene just told me five to seven, so. <laughs> I'm going to try to do probably just do some ad lib here, but I'm going to tell you a quick story. And because I've gotten the question, and a lot of people are wondering, you know, is this your real name? And you probably know where I'm going with this. Uh, yeah, it is. And uh, my my dad didn't know what he was saying, but uh, no. Quick story. When I was dean up at Montana State, I had uh, doing deanly things. I was out in Southern California on a fundraising trip. And you, multiple stops around uh, those parts of the country and, and a lot of alumni there. You've got a lot of alumni down there. 
And and uh, I tuned in a radio station, and uh, it was um, if you're familiar with that area, it's KKJZ, so it's K Jazz. It's a jazz radio station based out of public radio station based out of Long Beach, Long Beach State actually, and. Great jazz and blues, great mix, and something that I kind of have an affinity for, and uh, and so listened to it the whole number of days that I was there, and they they were streaming online, which at the time was kind of a new for me. I didn't really do a lot of internet radio, so I get back to the office, and I start tuning into that station on the uh, through the office uh, internet while I, while I'm at my desk on those occasions. And one day, like public radio stations do, they're doing a public uh, you know their fundraiser, their drives, and. Uh, I kind of felt guilty. I said, you know, I need to make a contribution. I've been listening to it. I'm enjoying this station. I really like it. They're doing a good job. I did an online contribution. Turn around, start doing my work, and they break in, and you know how this goes. Shirley from Long Beach has called in and given us $20. Good to hear from Shirley. They're going through this, and then I, and I'm just in the back of my mind. I hear this, hey, Jim, you're not going to get, you're not going to believe this. Bob Marley is alive, and he lives in Montana. <laughs> and he just gave us 50 bucks. So uh, it's true. I'm, my, my famous cousin has a different hairdo than I do. And, uh, but I just thought I'd share that little story with you that uh, sometimes is kind of fun. And you can understand a little bit, besides the fact that my dad is a Bob, my father-in-law is a Bob, and many of my first bosses were Bobs why I introduced myself as Robert. Okay, so thank you again for coming. And I will try to keep this fairly brief. Um, the, the, the introduction covered a lot of territory, and I know a lot of, uh, a lot of interest that you may have kind of comes down to uh, why now, why ISU, ISU excuse me, uh, why you? What's, you know, what's my attraction? What do I bring? So let me try to summarize that really, really quickly. And I, I'm it's going to be, this is a little bit ad lib, uh, so bear with me. Um, I know I'm not the first person to say great potential here. I see uh, a national university that it's emerging, and, and emerging in a sense that uh, can be highly recognized. You've got some world-class programs. You've got other programs that are highly regarded. You've got some programs maybe you're struggling, and, you, and, and every great state university has some, can say some of the same things. And I see opportunities here to build a, a really national visible, nationally visible university. And, and I think some of that can come from some of the work that, that I've experienced in. One of the goals that I would set out here, and I'm gonna share some vision statements with you, but just please bear in mind, anything I'll share as a vision is just something I see as potential. We need to work on a vision together. I'm not gonna stand here and be, and be so pretentious to say, this is your vision, go do it. That would be ridiculous. But here's some potential that I see. And I see potential for increased collaboration across multiple disciplines. This is, uh, and I'll come back to my experience at this. Uh, I see great potential for inter-campus collaboration, multi-state collaborations. By the way, for the, for the researchers in the office, that's where the, the agencies now today are really putting a lot of money in these broad, multi-state, multi-institution collaborations. And I see a lot of potential for that here. I will do what I can to promote that and have been fairly successful at doing that in my, in my, to my career to date, um, both at Montana State and at Missouri S&T. And um, I see potential also, so I'll look for those cross-disciplinary uh, efforts. I might mention my own research, if it's not obvious to you, uh, personally was very interdisciplinary. Um, I've, I've got fairly strong backgrounds in, in experimental psychology, in, in uh, uh, physiology, anatomy, work physiology, all working towards human factors. So I just, that's what I do. And I always, I thought everyone does that. But, uh, but this is where, not that we all gonna do this, but what I'm suggesting is this is analogous programs like this or where the future is. I see great potential and great need for private fundraising. Um, Great state universities um, can't do what they need to do without support from non-state areas. Okay, certainly tuition is part of that, and and that gets to another issue of we we need to settle the challenge of of our declining enrollment, 
And, and I've been fortunate to be part of systems in which we've raised our enrollments. It's a very competitive game today. I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know. And we need to step up our game there. For, for revenue support is also bringing in great students. And on the private side, I've been, been fortunate to be successful at uh, raising a, a fair amount of money in terms of my own college support. I had, we had the first six named professorships in my college ranging from about a half a million dollars to $5 million in size of endowment. And I had a chance to be a, a lead player in the development of what became the largest gift to the state of Montana, to any entity in the state of Montana, in the Asbjornsson Innovation Center. It was a 50 million, actually it was a $50 million gift matched by 20 million, uh, $70 million project. And so this is something that the state of Montana could not have done without strong support from, from our private uh, from my alumni. I was an alumni of, of Montana State. That's, that's what we need to do more of, and, I, and I'm ready, ready and able to do that, and, uh, and I enjoy that. I enjoyed that part of my job as dean. And uh, provost role is a little bit different, but uh, has, has different demands. So that's kind of in a nutshell what I see is some vision, what my experience in uh, and leading institutions that were uh, looking to raise their enrollments. My college went from about two, roughly, rough numbers, 2,000 students to 3,000 students during my deanship. Um, the university went from about 12,000 students to 16,000 students during my deanship. And I'm not claiming responsibility for all of that. I, we had great partners, but I just tell you that's the environment that I come from. And, and I'm, we've talked a little bit about the fundraising. So, so I think I have a skill set. Let me just kind of end on this. A skill set that includes a leadership style that's very inclusive, um, very relaxed. Um, I want to, I'm going to work with people. I have a, um, an open style, a transparent style. I, uh, some people call it the servant leader model. Whereas I see my job is to serve you and what you're doing because no president can be you know, fully successful at what they're trying to do without you being successful, okay? And so it's silly to comprehend and to contemplate anything different than just fully support what we, you know, to the degree we can, what you're doing with your students in your classroom, your, your laboratory, your studio, whatever it may be, the playing field as well. That's how the institution will become greater known, and uh, I'm fully supported to do that. The servant leader part is, yes, Tough decisions need to be made. I'm very collaborative on that, on making tough decisions. I'm going to work with you to um, arrive at a consensus as much as possible. And I've told many groups, my definition of consensus is not 100% agreement. And I'm sure that's good because I've never seen it, <laughs> okay? 100% agreement, at least sometimes for lunch, but that's about the extent of it. But the idea is what I want people to walk away from, it, walk away from our meetings is say, I understood the issue, even though I may not personally agree with that decision, I understood the rationale, I was heard, they, they understood my concern, and I can support that decision. That's, that's my aim in, in decisions that I make. So um, with that, I think, well, it was a little more than 5-7, but okay, <laughs> we got there. Let me, I, I'm anxious to talk to you about your concerns and your, your uh, your questions. How can I help? Okay. Questions, please. Uh, if I'm threatening here, I'll back up. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> sure. I'm Todd Johnson. I'm the director of Veterans Student Services Center. Um, my, my question is about, um, well, I'll back up. ISU's taken some hits lately, both internally and externally. Um, it's it's damaged morale. It's damaged uh, esprit de corps. Um, it has <clears throat> created silos within the university. Yeah. Can you speak to your um, unifying and bridge building experience? Sure. Thanks. Sir. Um, certainly, I'm, at this stage, I'm aware of of the. I forget how you phrase that. Uh, the concerns that have uh, that are facing the institution now, in terms of some internal strife and and issues that have been, you know, obviously the AUP sanction uh, part of that, and so my bridge building is is really going to be focused on not surprisingly communications, but but I need to you know try to keep this short. It's to say it's more than just better newsletters, better you know better websites, better things that you got to do. 
Okay, it's also about opening up and kind of involving folks in the conversation. I think the concern that, that I would have, and I would work with to the degree that's appropriate, that the president work with you to finish you know, your constitution, as I understand, in process. Um, I think it's vital that get done, and, and it get done in the way that, because the, the outcome is something that we all come together and agree, this is how we're gonna work together, okay? And, and both sides need to trust that. And so, so I'm anxious to see that completed. And, uh, but in the meantime, and ir irrespective, what you'll see from me is a person that's gonna be approachable and, and I will reach out to faculty groups, depending upon the question of the day, uh, maybe you know, through a town hall, could be through a focus group, through a, a task force that I may ask to provide. I'm, I'm looking for that opinion. I'm looking for that guidance um, to work through vital issues of the day. And, and I'm going to include this, uh, say this as well. I will include this, uh, excuse me, include inviting you into our home, okay, for a reception, just to welcome maybe new faculty. That's one event that I would look forward to. Uh, other faculty leaders, uh, different groups at different times come, come to our home. Because that's going to that's going to be that's kind of people that Margaret and I are. I hope we get a chance to meet her later, and and so those kinds of events. I know it's kind of seems well. It's it's a personal touch that we're going to try to add. To I think that's a good way to ask is, is to say it's a it's a bridge bend, bridge bending. How about bridge mending? Bridge bending. <laughs> uh, that's the kind of approach that that we'll take. I'm sure we'll, we'll work together throughout that and see what else we can do, but that's that's what I see initially. Thank you. Okay. Yes, yes, Alan. Be back. See if th this one's working. It is. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Marley. I'm glad to hear that you already are aware of the uh, AAUP sanction because my question has to do with that. Okay. Uh, so. Would you please comment on whether this situation concerns you? If not, why not? And if it is a concern for you, what would be your approach to rectifying the problems so that the AAUP can remove the sanction? Yeah. Thank you. So, good. yeah, thanks. I, I think I did touch on some of that. So the answer is yes, it concerns me. And uh, and I hope it would concern anyone. And, and I, I realize there's kind of different ways of looking at this, and I know I realize that uh, this was a complex issue that evolved over time, and there's no way I'm not going to stand here and pretend to be able to analyze and, uh, and kind of project an assessment of the entire situation. But I will pledge to you what I do believe is that it needs the sanction needs to be addressed, and 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 that's what I would look to do. Um, I think there's there's kind of an appropriate way to do that. It's one that I'm, I'll be honest with you, I've not had experience personally at needing to, needing to address a specific sanction, but uh, there are experts out there that, that can provide some guidance. But more importantly, what are we going to do on campus to kind of fix the base problem, okay? The base problem is, I think from a structural point of view, you don't have a constitution. But I think even beyond that, what it appears to me is there's been this level of distrust okay, between faculty and administration. As, and, I'm just going to say it this way. You got to take it head on, and that's that's what I would look to do. I think part of my answer to the previous question is to say this is how we would address, you know, head on the the issue of this of the distrust, and and show that uh, you're going to have input. Your your voice will be heard, and at the moment you'll have to take my word for that. But that's what I'm going to seek out is that your voice will be heard in, in a variety of ways. You have the opportunity, at least, to be heard in a variety of ways, uh, you know, you know, in every aspect of, of the university. Certainly, I think we all understand the, 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 the ownership of the, of the curricula by faculty. What my goal is, to, is to, at the end of the day, you would be able to reflect back on my administration to say, we had some ownership of the university. And, and I'm, I'm kind of bypassing, you know, all the things we can read through AEP and what, AUP, excuse me, and, you know, who's, who makes final decisions and all that. I mean, the, we know that structure. The issue is, did, do you feel some ownership because of the input that you had and decisions you helped make? And that's what I would strive to create. Uh, <laughs> 
Come on up. <laughs> oh, well, sorry. <laughs> I'm encroaching on everyone. Dr. Marley. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is James Izar, and I'm connected with Academic Affairs Student, Su Student Support Services slash Athletic Support Services slash Representative from Staff Council slash University Ombuds. So my question uh, for you this afternoon kind of has two parts. Uh, if you are selected as our next leader, can you describe the university environment we can expect under your leadership related to the excellent inclusion principles and why uh, in your accomplishments and in the, your veto on your faculty and student diversity section, um, you didn't have any mention of staff initiatives and then also the fact that we have uh, our uh, Fort Hall Indian Reservation eight miles away. Yeah. So how would that look under your leadership? Sure. Thank you. And and uh, and I'm, I'm pleased that you took time away from all those jobs to come visit this afternoon. <laughs> and I can see that your your energy you put into things. I hope that wasn't a workplace injury that you suffered there. <laughs> Um, but in all seriousness, James, to your question, um, so my, I think the two parts are that my, uh, my involvement in diversity, let me kind of phrase it this way, is, is uh, there's, I think her name was Vivian Vance, is an author in, in this area who used words to this effect, and I, always, I think I usually get it wrong, but that university, faculty and staff are windows into the world and out to the world for our students, okay, and for the public at, at large. And it's it's a metaphor, so f forgive me. Um, the the window metaphor, meaning that um, people, the public, and the students who look into the university, this is what they see. And and increasingly, we have um, a diverse population, certainly in this state, growing more diverse, but around the nation as well. And likewise, when, they're, when students are here, what they see um, looking out is reflected in, in the faculty and staff as well. So it's incumbent upon us to, and, I, and, and sometimes this gets boiled down to what we look like physically and, and our color and our, and our gender. That's just part of the picture. You, you refer to inclusiveness as well. And we'll come back to that. But it's important that we have diversity in in our gender and our ethnicity but diversity in thought okay these are things that I that I'm have promoted and I, th I thank you for reading that section and just real quickly I have promoted uh, diversity in our student body in Montana our largest minority population were Native Americans and in our college which was the largest engineering really the only engineering college in the state beyond one program in Butte we had, I could count on two hands, the number of Native American students in my college out of 2,000 at the time. That was unacceptable when we had, you know, almost 8% of the population in the state. And, and, and so that led me to pursue a number of programs that, uh, to keep this short, led us to, at the time I left, we were ranked fifth in the nation in the rate of graduation for Native American engineers and computer scientists. Um, I increased my gender diversity of my faculty fivefold in, with women. In our highly talented women joined our faculty, and now we started from low numbers, and, and it was modest. But it, but but this was important for our for our students. The in, the aspect of inclusiveness is critical as well because it kind of touches on some themes that have already been discussed. Um, I, I would argue that that. Uh, the strife that's been here, really that friction between and distrust between faculty and administration to a degree is related to what we do as a, to promote inclusiveness. Because if folks felt like they were welcome to provide input, to be part of the system as it were, I think fewer problems may be seen. But the inclusiveness really gets down to what does this campus look like to supporting underrepresented minorities and, and those that uh, are less well represented in higher education in general. Now you asked me about my staff and I, 
I confess, I, I wish I had more materials. I see a weakness in my CV that I should address. Uh, in my current role as provost, the staff council reports up through the, to directly to the chancellor. And so I, I didn't have much to report there. Uh, in my role as dean, um, you know, it, it's an area that I was concerned. And I, I will tell you that students, faculty, staff, being three of the top constituencies that we have, you know this, students see more staff on a daily basis than they will faculty. That's just a reality. Okay, so our faculty, excuse me, our staff, need to reflect diversity of, of appearance and thought, and they need to be inclusive to our students, otherwise we lose both. So, it's probably over my time limit on that particular question, but thank you, That's, it's an excellent one. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? Another workplace injury, okay. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, um, yeah. so I, I certainly appreciate, Dr. Marley, your considerations for diversity and inclusion. I think that's certainly important to our work across multiple divisions, both for staff and faculty. And so I think my, particularly in this consideration for these questions, I'm also gonna ask a two-part question. One that speaks particularly not only to representation of diversity and inclusion on campus, but also to the practice and praxis of it. So I think particularly, um, as part of these two-part questions, um, what um, I would say, how would you respond to particularly inequities on campus um, when, regarding especially racial inequities and inequities for gender and LGBTQ plus communities on campus? So that's the first part of the question. And I think the second is, what is um, what do you feel is the responsibility of senior leaders and administration on campus to speak particularly to um, um, inequities incurring for students. Um, so what messages should be sent, particularly in um, emails to uh, widespread emails to campus or um, emails that are coming from upper administration or even just public messaging on our um, materials, um, particularly to students and certainly to affirm and humanize these communities. Yeah. So, sorry, I'm gonna roll away now. <laughs> okay. Um. Lot there. Let me let me try to uh, compact this just a bit for for my own uh, hopefully clarity to you. So uh, you refer to inequities, and I think the fact that um, we can admit we have inequities when we look at the population of, of faculty and uh, and students here, and and it's not a it's not uh, an issue that has as we point to say is anyone's fault. What do we do about it now? And that's. And, and I will tell you, because jump into the second part of your question, absolutely, it's senior administration, and I would throw the president on the front of that bus <laughs> to say, the president has to set a tone for inclusiveness and, and what we expect. And, and I will, that will reach out to the deans, it will reach out to other divisions within the university to say, you know, in terms of our hiring processes, because they, they see, the it's, sorry, it's almost high. Uh, these things don't get solved overnight, and I know you appreciate that, but we need to show progress, okay? And, and, and I think that's the important part. And th uh, within that question, you also asked about communications from the president, okay, I'll say. Um, it's critical. And I'll, t I'll share a quick vignette on my current campus. This is an issue that has come up. We had a student that posted a... Uh, um, and I'm not the greatest social media person, but I forget the, it wasn't uh, it was uh, wasn't Twitter, but it was let's say Snapchat. Thank you. You probably maybe you know the story already. <laughs> Snapchat. Um, a person posted. This person had a uh, a uh, what do call it, a service pet. Okay, and it turned out it was a snake. Okay, uh, I know. <laughs> But this is not uncommon. I saw it in Montana, we saw it here. Um, this snake was uh, new and she's got pictures. It was a female student and she put pictures all on the Snapchat and she said, I need help naming my new snake. And on this, she had very extremely vulgar, racially toned comments. Okay, I'm not, I won't repeat them. But um, they were absolutely offending. With anyone that couldn't have been offended, I'd like to talk to them, okay? And 
and that went out and it immediately set off a firestorm amongst, well, our African-American students, okay? Because these were among the racial tones. And, and so we got together as a cabinet. My chancellor brought together, who, who I think did the right things at the right time on this, and I learned from that, and I would try to do the same thing that you cannot underestimate the power of what this has because we had an entire group of students. We have a, a, a significant number of African-American students on our campus and they were all instantly offended and many others, not just them. It was unacceptable. Um, I will be honest with you, I was talking to the Dean of Students about some very restrictive um, sanctions against that student. Our chancellor ultimately said, you know, if we don't teach this student better, who will? because they get launched out into society if we just kick them out. Because honestly, there have been things, uh, I'll, be, I'll say it this way, situations at Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma, where the president instantly got rid of that, that student group. I, I can appreciate what he did, but now they're, they're out there somewhere else. And we don't, you know, this is an opportunity to learn. And so, so we took the opportunity to set up some forums we had a, uh, a sequence of uh, hearing, uh, meetings, rather, open meetings, called Speaking of Race. That was what it was titled. And, and so I think that was extremely important, and it was featured on the web as a story. And we got a lot of pushback on that. There were faculty who wrote in, some staff wrote in, other public members, public uh, supporters wrote in and said, that was inappropriate, and you should have never done this, and it's not a good promotional item. Well, it wasn't meant to be a it wasn't meant to be promotion of the university. It's meant to help us heal some issues, and uh, and so so we were steadfast in maintaining this was the appropriate communications going forward, and and so and and I appreciate my chancellor taking a strong role on that, and and I I will I will tell you I would do the same, but that's through that example. Okay. What else? Uh, my name is Jim DeSanza. I'm chair in communication, media, and persuasion. And I have just a quick comment and a question. Uh, you may see some of us draw back a little bit when you talk about increasing our national uh, reputation. Uh, when our previous administration came here, they decided we were going to become the MIT of the West. And so, uh, a lot of us would just be happy not being dead last in Idaho, and then we can work uh, up from there. Sure. So uh, there, there's a, a history of, of some lofty ambition without uh, a lot of thought put behind it. So I, I know that doesn't apply to you. Um, but I would argue that I think a lot of our uh, problems stem not only from a broken relationship with the faculty, but this institution has a broken relationship with the community as well. And I'd ask uh, what you might do to try to repair and, and make yeah. that better. And then we can worry about some of the bigger things. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I won't second guess anyone else's goals, um, but that certainly that sounded pretty lofty. Uh, uh, and and I want to be, I do want to, clarify that uh, when I talk about raising profiles, I've already talked to um, um, the, some of the vice presidents, um, particularly the research vice president, about, um, I, pardon me, I think this institution can achieve loftier um, ambitions in, and, and can sustain loftier ambitions in terms of our research and scholarship um, to the extent that it can be recognized by places like Carnegie in higher rankings there, because I think you deserve, I think you have the capacity to be greater than a moderate research university, which is what you're ranked in there. Now, by the way, that ties you for a second in Idaho, <laughs> okay? Uh, but aside from that, uh, you're, so, so I'm, I'm not saying we should be them. You know, I think that's, frankly, that's probably, I would only react to this to say, we need to be Idaho State, and Idaho State can be a, a national brand, and that's what I'm suggesting. The, the question about the community, and, and I recognize there's some, some, some concerns there, and, and I, I kind of used part of this answer earlier to say that uh, we have about five or six constituents, depending on how you count. Our constituents are constituents of the great university is, uh, of course, faculty, students, uh, staff, and, and alumni. Those, uh, and, and by the way, if I may say so, Great faculty, great students, great alumni. This is why it's a great, the makings of a great university. Uh, very loyal alumni who send their kids here. That's, that says a lot, it really does. Um, 
And then beyond the alumni, the, those who come to hire our students is a great constituent, okay? And, and the, the public, okay? Now in the public, you can kind of break down a few ways, all right? There's, there's the public who read websites, okay? And aren't happy with the basketball team or whatever, that public. You've got elected officials, okay? And more local public um, officials that, that I'm gonna get to meet here in the next hour. That group, I would just tell them, that's what I will tell them in the next hour is, you're my constituent. Let's see, sorry, didn't mean to hit, my, hit that mic. You're my constituent. And I need to serve you too, because this is an important asset for the community. It's an important asset for the state. I believe it's an important asset to the, to the nation, but, that's, but it has to start here, obviously. And so one of the things, and I'm gonna come back to the answer that I gave here at the very beginning of the hour, is uh, I'm gonna look to meet these folks. I'm gonna invite them into our home. Um, they're gonna see us in the community. Uh, they'll see us at, uh, whether it be shows, productions, whatever the case may be. Uh, I just mentioned, I mentioned to the lunch crowd, uh, the vice president, I said, given the shape of my old truck, I think an auto dealer will probably see me fairly quickly. And, uh, and so we're gonna look forward to be engaged in the community that way. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Patricia Overy. I'm with the College of Arts and Letters. And I'd like to thank you for being here today and giving us an opportunity uh, to get to know you better. Thank you. While efforts to increase enrollment and strengthen retention numbers have been explored by many universities across the country, new approaches to this process are continuously being redefined. <laughs> In your opinion, can you explain how you see the role of faculty and staff evolving to better assist with this process? And can you give us an example of the type of engagement you have supported uh, during your position as Provost Executive Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs? So um, your, the premise of your question is interesting and, and, and accurate, I would say to the extent that uh, re recruitment retention and uh, progress towards degree is, is an issue that continues to be re redefined. There's some public definitions, or I should say uh, federally mandated defined definitions. And, but one thing that's, a, and when, we, so when, when someone talks about retention rate, recruitment rate, usually the metric is involving first time, full time students. And I think you understand that well. And, and there's been a number of scholars that have talked about, including uh, education leaders, and I mentioned one specifically, Diana Natalicio, president of UTEP, has helped redefine um, the conversation to go away from just serving first-time, full-time students, because nationally, that's a shrinking number of, of our students, okay? And I think at this institution, we have a unique population that comes here that may be first-time, full-time, but you have a lot of students who are starting part-time, who, who may finish part-time, okay? And, and so we need to serve them equally well. And I think having metrics that allow us to kind of chart their progress um, is good. And let me say, one of the things that uh, President Natalicio talks about is, let's define student success in the terms of what students look for. Okay, all too often we say student success is X, Y, Z, getting you know, first year to second year retention. Okay, that's a good metric, don't get me wrong, but it's not the only one and it doesn't fit every student. So I wanna, I'm in that crowd that wants to help kind of expand the definition to say, if I'm starting part-time, if I have to take a year out, I, that's how I need to be accounted for and work with that student and make sure that student is successful in what they're trying to do through their career here at Idaho State. So I would look to create, um, even if unofficial, some metrics that would guide guide that step. I think you asked me, the second part of that question um, was about, pardon me, about any example that I have that I can call upon uh, to have increased this. So one of the things that we did, um, I'm gonna go back to when I was dean, because this is a little more relevant to, I think, your question. And, and it's in the question related to how did we increase our graduation rate for Native American students? There was, we had a little bit of federal support to get this kicked off, but essentially 
it was relying upon some tried and true techniques that had just never been applied to that population. And that's a population, I don't think, I'm sure it's not gonna be a surprise to you to hear, like other ethnic populations where um, students tend to come and go even during the semester. They may go back in Montana, I'm talking about going from Bozeman to the Fort Peck Reservation, which is, you know, it's like going from here to DC, okay? in relative terms. And so when they go home, take care of grandma. That's a, you know, and then they miss lab on Monday. Okay, those are the kinds of things our students were having to work work through. And what I what I was able to work with faculty and uh, because I think faculty were concerned, but it's difficult to to incorporate how, how do I help that student when I've got the demands of the rest of the students who I need to have a lab on Monday. Okay, how can I help this student out? And so we, were, we worked through some protocols, which we're not encouraging students to take that time out, but we recognize it's a realistic part of what happens in that community. And it's just something we had not done. Other, many of the community colleges in other parts of the world have, have kind of mastered some of this, but it's, it's some individual work, and yes, it's a little bit labor intensive, relatively speaking, but I'll just leave you with this thought. We know, we generally know how to do this because most of this has been learned in higher ed in what we do with our student athletes. And our student athletes at Missouri S&T as well as Montana State, I suspect here too, I haven't looked at this, have generally speaking have higher graduation rates than do the general population. Why? We provide a lot of resource for them, okay? Now we don't provide the same resource for all of our students. We don't need to in many cases, okay? But we're, are we prepared to do that for special, you know, for other need populations? So that's a relatively short answer for you. Thank you. We have time for one more question, please. Good afternoon, Hi. Dr. Marley. Thank you for being here today. Um, I am Sandra Shropshire from the library, okay. and I have a question. Um, You've talked today about many of the challenges that ISU faces. You've acknowledged some of them yourself, and there may be others you are aware of that you have not yet voiced. Um, among those you've talked about are the need to increase enrollment, mm -hmm. the AAUP sanction, uh, community relations, and um, the Carnegie classification. Mm -hmm situation. Um, which of these, if you if you were to choose, which gives you pause? What concerns you or keeps you up at night? Hmm. Okay, of, of the ones that we've talked about. Yeah. And, and, and throw in any others you're aware of that <laughs> Well, I, I, I appreciate I was strategically not trying to go through a laundry list of concerns that might be here. Um, because any great university is going to have lots of concerns. Uh, facilities being among them, I didn't really talk much about that. I think we need to see some improvements in some facilities. Some are great. Um, what's going to keep me up at night? Um, probably, probably A, B, C, D, you know, a number of those perhaps. But what I, what would bother me most is if we can't make progress on any of those. Okay, I'll be honest with you. I think. Um, let me share a quick vignette with me, and he's gonna pull the hook on me in a minute, so just, just tell me when he comes behind and grabs me. One of the things that I had a, hired a dean who came to me from, he's from Iowa State, and he used the term, he said, I really appreciate your management style. He said, you, he said, you, you kind of lead with a gentle hand. And that, it's a euphemism, obviously, and, but what he was referring to is, I'm not a micromanager, I'm, I'm, a, I'm empowering my staff to those who report to me, I would empower folks all around me. I'm gonna push authority down as far as possible. Let you make decisions to, to run things the way you see fit. I'm here to help be accountable for all that because I'm gonna be held accountable and that we're moving in the direction that we need to be moving. That's, that's what I see my role. Many of these things could cause concern. I see it as, I think it's a great challenge. I, I, I'm, I'm anxious to kind of hit the road running to see how can I work with faculty to get get past the trust issue and frankly my administration. It's a two-way street. Okay, those those that report to me as administrators, I'm going to look to them for changes in the way we do business with the faculty, and and so we need to come to a point of trust. That's probably going to be 
as important as anything to get started, okay? And I think, you know, facilities is gonna be an issue. Uh, the, you know, other things we've talked about will all be there to deal with. I hope they don't keep me up too much because I lose sleep for lots of reasons I don't need. And I'm try, I don't mean to be tongue in cheek about it, but, but uh, those are the kinds of things that I will spend some energy on in trying to, uh, uh, trying to improve the culture here. I'm sorry, improve the climate. And, uh, and then beyond that, I'll need to spend some time working with um, increasing the private support because that's going to be critical for us moving forward if we don't have increases in private support. I hope that's helpful to your question. Yes. Thank Great. You. Thank you, Dr. Marley. Appreciate your time being here today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, just remember that uh, Friday midnight would be the last time to uh, have any questions or comments, not really questions, but comments on the website. So Friday, this Friday. Thank you very much. Have a great day.